This is a sermon from St. Paul's Church, Brookfield, Connecticut, transforming lives through Jesus. For more information, go to www.stpaulsbrookfield.com. Love, do good, bless, pray. That's the title of this message this morning, right from our Lord's words themselves. Love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. Bless those that curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Could we find more challenging words? We find ourselves in a continuation of Luke's account of the Sermon on the Plain. Here Jesus has come down from the mountain. He's collected his disciples. He's speaking to a huge crowd on a level place. And Luke tells us he's speaking up to his disciples. That is, he's elevating them, putting himself beneath them. And it continues in this message this morning as we look at it because Jesus is calling everybody who will listen to be further elevated. Not just those who are experiencing difficulty in relationships, but those causing the difficulties. And for us to even begin to understand how we could possibly live this out, there are some things we need to understand. Now, we are dating ourselves here, but do you remember the IBM personal computer from 30 plus years ago? It had a feature called reveal codes. Whereas everything you saw that was visible on the screen, if you got lost or confused and needed to backtrack and find out what was really going on in the inner system, reveal codes would tell you. And so as we hear Jesus' words, there are some reveal codes from the scriptures that will help us understand what is going on in the larger context where we find Jesus' commands. And these are commands, by the way. These are not suggestions. He's saying, if you're listening to me, then you will love, you will do good, you will bless, and you will pray. But here are the reveal codes, because without this understanding, these are impossible commands. Jesus did say, with God all things are possible, and there's no way we can fulfill this calling without God's grace. So the reveal codes are these, among many others. One, God is good and God is love. God promises to work all things for good for those who are called according to God's purposes and who love God. This is a starting point as we listen to Jesus' words. Also, God is for you. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so as we hear Jesus' words, he's calling us not to be reactive victims, but to be spiritual warriors. And that takes us to some more reveal codes. We are in a pitched spiritual battle all the time. Yes, we're human beings made of flesh and blood, but ultimately we're spiritual beings dealing with spiritual realities behind the scenes that are not visible to the human eye, but they're very real. So real that in our conflicts and our relationships, while we often think it's about personality disagreements or deep problems we've had and interpersonal connections, we're invited to look at the spiritual component behind everything. And this is the only way that we can begin to launch out as warriors of love. Because we are always in a battle, and the battle belongs to the Lord, and yet he chooses to use us to wield certain weapons, to step into this battle, and those weapons are love, goodness, blessing, and prayer. Now, before we go through those commands, we need to understand another context here. Jesus says, turn the other cheek. Now, we've heard this, all of us, but the question is, do we really understand the deep meaning of this. You know, when you hear that turn the other cheek, it sounds like some kind of virtuous living that we really don't want to engage in. It's about passivity, maybe in a doormat, allowing others to beat up on us. That is not what Jesus is talking about. We have to look at Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount to get the full picture here. That's where Jesus says, if somebody strikes you on the right cheek, give them your left cheek. Now, in Jesus' time, 
The left hand was unclean, and so you'd only use the right hand in human interactions, including hitting somebody. So here Jesus describes two individuals in this illustration. One is the dominant one, and one is inferior. The dominant one has the right hand and hits the other person on their right cheek. So how do you do that? There's only one way you can do it. It's with a back slap, which was a way of treating an inferior person in that Roman culture where there were masters and slaves. But what Jesus is saying is don't shrink back. Don't be the victim. Step into your aggressor and show your left cheek, which means that aggressor would actually have to hit you this time with an open palm. And the significance of that is suddenly you're forcing that person to be on equal ground with you. You're elevating yourself, saying, now I'm your equal, hit me again. You see, Jesus is saying, don't be a victim, be a spiritual warrior. Step into the fray, knowing that the battle belongs to the Lord, and I'm with you, and I'm love, and I'm goodness, and I'm calling you to step forth and to be elevated, and possibly to elevate the other by your example. So Jesus says, love your enemies. Now in that culture, generational retaliation was the norm. Jesus is saying, step into it with love, my love. Only when we're rooted and grounded in Christ can we possibly do this, having Christ as our center, because left to ourselves, we will draw circles and keep people out or keep ourselves at a distance. But what Jesus is saying is, if you're centered in me, you can step out into all kinds of challenging situations and bear the love that I have in you. That's why our collect talks about the love of God is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. This is not our own self-effort at all, but it does involve dying to self, that Christ might live in us. During the Civil War, <clears throat> Abraham Lincoln went to a reception, and at the reception, he referred to the Southerners as, quote, errant human beings. Now, a woman was with him and was very offended by this and thought he should have been much harsher on those Southerners. And she said, how could you call them just errant human beings? They need to be destroyed. And Lincoln said to her, Madam, do I not destroy my enemies when I make them my friends? Lincoln's ethic, his approach, was based upon Jesus' words, love your enemies. So a challenge for us, practically speaking, is as we are rooted and grounded in God's love, are we willing to see those that we now see as enemies as potential friends? Sometime far from now, maybe very soon, by putting it all in the Lord's hands. Because for us to say we know that someone will always be an enemy is to say that we have the mind of God, and we don't. God is good, God is love, God promises to work all things for good for those who love God and are called according to God's purposes, so why not? Why couldn't an enemy become a friend? We don't know if that's going to happen, but with God all things are possible. And so again, we're not called to be emotionally reactive, we're proactive warriors of love, stepping forth, not just being elevated ourselves, but daring to elevate the other even if we don't think they deserve it, just as perhaps once we knew we didn't deserve it either and we've been elevated in God's love. So love your enemies. We can't do this on our own. It's only the work of God in us. Do good to those that hate you. Who wants to do that? Jesus is saying, if you're listening, this is what you're going to do. Each time we offer an act of goodness to an undeserved party, we're reminded that we've been shown mercy too when we didn't deserve it. And we're tipping the balance just a little bit more for God's grace as warriors of love stepping into the fray, bringing forth a kingdom into this world. When I was in seminary, we had a project which was to restart a broken down Episcopal church in an inner city area. And our professor said, you must do three good deeds for each person in that neighborhood you're going to reach before you even invite them to church, before you even tell them about Jesus. 
well, that was challenging because in many ways it's much easier to put out a tract or tell them about Jesus or say, hey, you know what? Uh, church is at 9 a.m. You should come. No, we had to get down and dirty, do some good deeds for these folks. And many of those moments went really well, but not all of them did. One fellow student and I tried to offer to repair a man's broken down screen on his front door. He chased us off the porch. So we looked at each other and we said, well, we got to get a good grade in this class. We have to do this three times, right? So we went back a second time, chased away again. Third time, you can imagine what happened. Chased away and threatened this time with physical force. So we thought, okay, we, we tried. Well, would you know that the day that we opened up the church for its first service, that man behind the screen door walked in? What do we know? Do we have the mind of God? No, but we're called to have the mind of Christ at the same time, to love and to do good. And to bless. Bless those that curse you. Another challenge the word curse that Jesus is using in that original language has everything to do with a spiritual reality. So Jesus is talking about spiritual warfare here. He's saying that your words have power. Your words can be used for tremendous good by way of a blessing. They can also be used for a curse to bring negativity and more bondage and destruction, not just into your life, but into the life of another. Be different. Bless. It's a free gift from the Spirit. It costs us nothing. When we think about our dialogues, we have a lot, both in verbal and written form, especially with the internet and blogs, etc. I don't need to tell you how polarized our world is increasingly becoming through the way we communicate, through what are curses back and forth all the time. But it can be different with us. And one way we can communicate is we can have a filter and before we say something or write something, we can ask ourselves the following. With what I'm about to communicate, is it kind? Is it necessary? Is it true? You've heard this before. We're a kingdom culture church. We're always reminding ourselves of the higher standard, the elevated status that Jesus is calling us to. Not to be victims, not to be reactive, but to step forth proactively as warriors of love. And so is it kind? Is it necessary? Is it true? That could be part of our blessing. Yes, even in the midst of those that are cursing at us. So love. Do good. Bless and now pray. Pray for those who would abuse you. This sounds pretty shocking when you hear it. There's no tolerance for abuse. But there is a call to pray all the time. To join with Jesus, who was praying from the cross just before drawing his last breath, who said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You see, Jesus had the mind of God. He was God in the flesh. And so as we pray, we join in with what Jesus is already doing at the right hand of the Father, because he lives to intercede. He's continually praying, and he's inviting us into this beautiful orchestra of prayer with all the saints throughout all time, which is one of those weapons we wield as warriors of love. Prayer. Prayer that can change people. Prayer that can move mountains. Prayer that can bring forth what we thought was impossible and suddenly it becomes quite possible when we see people turn. It begins with prayer. It continues with prayer. It ends with prayer. Everything is prayer when it comes to the spiritual battle. Think about your life, how you've been turned away from certain things and toward God. There are so many unanswered questions when it comes to what we've gone through in life, and I would not presume to tell you that it's all okay, because the forms of abuse that we've gone through and the things we've experienced are unique to you and to me. I cannot tell you that I understand what you're going through. But what I can say is that as we pray, we join together into the heart of God, and we find community and love and support through prayer, which sustains us and which changes us. 
And that's what each of these commands, these four commands are all about. That the change would begin in us. That we would not shrink back and be destroyed, but rather step forth as more than conquerors through him who loves us. Not to change an empire in this world, but to bring forth gently and yet powerfully a kingdom. Because we are people of a kingdom. A kingdom with a certain culture. And once again in our epistle reading, we hear about resurrection. And what Paul is saying is that in order to rise, first we have to die. And so as Jesus speaks to us and calls us to be elevated, he's calling us, yes, to die, to die to self, to surrender our own will for God's will, and to trust the Lord even when we don't understand. Sometimes we think that the Christian life is learning about how to die. That's just part of it. The Christian life is really about how to live, how to live and how to elevate others as a foretaste and a sign of the resurrection, which is the heart of our faith. Sometimes we can be, as they say, too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. But I pray that this morning as we hear our Lord's words, we'll know exactly what we're supposed to do here, now, right on this earth, to bring forth a kingdom that is not of this world, but which is very much in it and part of it. May God's will be done in our lives and together as a kingdom culture on earth, as it always is in heaven. Amen. Amen.